Our hearts today are full with joy, full of praise, full of thanksgiving. We're full of anticipation. Lord, I feel a little bit like the Israelites there uh, at the bank of the Red Sea. Uh, when you parted the waters and they walked across on dry land and the enemy was behind them and then the waters closed in and drowned them all uh, and the Israelites had such a magnificent future, uh, not perfect future, they messed up, but still you were faithful and in the end you did exactly what you had promised. You made a nation. You gave them the land, you gave them the people, you gave them the king. They had everything they needed. They had power. They had miracles. They had your presence. They had your worship. They had your word. They had your covenants. They had a magnificent future. And Lord, that's how I'm feeling with our church today. Not to make too much of an exaggeration, but we are on the banks of a great future. And we're so thankful that as our Moses passes off the scene, uh, to other fields of ministry, you've given us a new Joshua, and his name is Joshua. Uh, Lord, uh, we just thank you for what you're going to do, and thank you that everyone here can be a part. We can be a part by our prayers, we can be a part by our, our giving, we can be a part by our presence, coming to the services and being a part of all the activities. Uh, and uh, when we see new Pastor Josh, encourage him, pat him on the back, hug him, hug his wife and his children just making them feel wanted and loved and thrilled, Lord, that they're here with us and to keep our faith strong in the God who has engineered, designed, and brought it all to pass. So we give you thanks. Now, Lord, as we turn our attention to uh, the little book of Ruth, we're going to begin chapter 2. It's taking us four weeks to get here, and we got four weeks to get through chapter 4. Will we make it? Yes, we will. And we just thank you for every verse every word in this book and the story that it tells. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus for his sake. Amen. All right. Anybody come in while I was praying? Nobody came in. Thank you, Perry. And thank you, Perry. I got I marked your name off too, so you're you're here. All right, quick review. Last week um, we saw that uh, Naomi and Ruth got back to the land and when they got there everyone was so glad to see her. And they called her, Naomi's back, Naomi's back. And she said, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me delightful. Don't call me pleasant. I've got a new name, Bitter. Call me Mara. Because God has dealt bitterly with me. God has afflicted me. God just killed my husband, killed my boys, gave me no grandchildren, left me in poverty in a foreign country where I didn't even speak the language and had strange, wicked filthy gods there and that's where he left me there and now I've got this daughter-in-law I got responsible for I got to take care of her and I got no job and I got no house and boy she was just really uh, complaining against God and they got there and what time of year was it when they got there back to Israel to Bethlehem harvest time <laughs> Uh, it wasn't at the end of barley harvest. It was at the beginning, the time where they had plenty of barley, and along with that would have been wheat at the same time. Uh, and we're going to talk today about gleaning, what Ruth did. Ruth right off went out and got herself a job uh, and was able to take care of and provide for her. Uh, and you think that was an accident? God Right, there she was complaining about everything. You know, it's like kind of complaining to God about all the bills you've got. And you're just griping. And then the mail comes, and, you know, and I've had this experience a lot. You open up your mail, and there's a refund from something for, for $1,000. And you think, wow, you know, wow. Uh, you can't not, when God leads, he's going to provide. He's going to take care of you. And he's doing that to show Naomi that she was wrong about him. Her bitterness, her rant was totally unbiblical, unfounded. And we saw last week that we have a hint that I think she really knew that. I think she was venting. You ever just said things to see where they land? You ever talk to your husband or you just say things and want to see, well, I wonder, is that going to stick on the wall? 
And I'm just going to throw that out there and see, is he going to reel it in? Is she, you know, what's, and that we, it's called venting. We just, it's not really what's there, but at the moment, that's how we're feeling. We're just feeling that way. And I think that's how she was feeling. But she refers to the Lord in verse 21 of chapter 1. Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. Remember the word Almighty? It comes to the word Shaddai. Most of the time in the Old Testament, El Shaddai, God Almighty. And we saw that this word uh, uh, Shaddai in the Hebrew uh, basically means breast breast and some think it's talking about it it, it has what one uh, uh hebrew greek uh english book said a dubious etymology dubious means hmm that's ponderous but i'm not really sure that could be right we're not really sure where shad or shed i came from some think it means mountain uh, and God is the God of the mountains because he's high, he's lifted up, he's over everything, he's strong, he's the God of the mountains. But I've chosen the word shad actually means breast. And it would refer quite often to a woman taking her child to nurture the child, protect the child, keep the child. When the child is distressed, <coughs> when your child is distressed, <coughs> what do you do? You scoop him up or her? I mean, you isn't even even the daddy picks him up and you hold him like that i got picture me holding my children like this holding that little head up to maybe they might feel the warmth of your body and the protection of your body and they feel secure and on they feel tight there uh so god is the god of the mountains to be sure but i also see him and i think she saw him as the god who nurtures the god who protects just like Jesus talked about Jerusalem, he said, how often would have gathered you to me like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings up to her breast to protect and to nurture and to keep. So I don't think really Naomi was really feeling this way about the Lord in concrete facts. But at that moment, that's how she was, her emotions were running. Well, that brings us to chapter one, uh, chapter two, return. Uh, is how we end it uh, in chapter 1. And now we come and we're going to look at um, chapter 2. We finally made it here. Rendezvous. Thank you. Boy, you're so quick. Rendezvous. Divine appointment. I love this. Let's just read some of the verses starting in chapter 2, verse 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, his name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess, you're going to notice that. We pointed that out our first, our first session. Uh, how long does this woman have to bear that title, the Moabitess, the Moabitess, the Moabitess? We'll see it more than once in this chapter alone. In fact, it's not until chapter 4 she's just called Ruth. It's like her past. She just can't get shed of it. I mean, suppose she'd been a drug addict, or suppose she'd been an adulteress, or suppose she had been something else, and every time, oh, Mo, uh, Ruth the adulteress, Ruth the drug addict, Ruth the jailbird, Ruth the shoplifter, whatever, she, this, this title of Moabitess, she just couldn't shake it, no matter how her character, which we'll find, was sterling. She was as good as any Israelite woman. Now, we're going to see that today and next week. So... So Ruth the Moabite has said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. She says, Let me go out and glean. Now gleaning, if you, we, we've all been to Sunday school here. Some of us been to Sunday school for a long time. And, and we know that gleaning was something that was very common in the Middle East, not just in Israel. They did gleaning in Moab and Ammon and Philistia. They did gleaning all over the place because the, that's how the poor people got their money. That's how they got daily sustenance. They go out and they see the John Deere tractor going down the road and they're spitting out stuff and they get behind the, the tractor, which in those days was a bunch of oxen with yoke. And they would, whatever was left, they could gather it up. And they would, they would get their, their apron and they'd pull it up like this and they would just load it up. They just loaded up. That was their, their, their pockets in those days, these folds of their robes. And they would just gather it, and that's what she did. She was gleaning, getting the leavings of the barley and the wheat. That's what she did. That was her job. Uh, so 
Naomi says, go, my daughter. That's a good idea. You go on out, and uh, you just look around. There's all kinds of fields out there. I mean, it's, they didn't have, you know, skyscrapers and parking lots and shopping centers. They just had little houses and caves and all, and then all these fields. And she just, oh, let's see. That's a nice field. There's a few women out there. I'll get behind them, and I'll just glean. And that's what she did. And it says in verse 3, then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. She happened. Hmm. We're going to examine that in a little bit. Now, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in the char charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reaper said, this was the supervisor, and he was the shift foreman, it's the young Moabite woman. There it is again. It's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi. He didn't even use her name. Came back from the country Moab. And she said, she came to me and she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers. among the." So she had asked permission. She didn't just barge in there. So she came and has continued from morning till now. She's been here all day. And though she rested a little while in the house. And we'll go on a little bit after that. Let's go back and let's look at, um, let's talk about Boaz. His name, Boaz, anybody know what it meant in your study? Stereo speakers? That's what he, his name meant? Oh, that was so good. Did y'all get what she said? Yeah, not Bo's, not Bo's, Boaz, but that's good. You had me, so you had me, so. Boaz meant fleetness, fleetness or quickness of feet. Uh, this guy, uh, his name meant fast. He was speedy. And that's what they called him. It was a name that could be called valor. Because when you think about soldiers today, they're in airplanes, they're in tanks, they're in jeeps, they're in all these mechanized things. You know, it's not like fighting a war during the War of Independence or even the Civil War, or even the World War I or World War II. And everyone's got a tank. They got something, you know, uh, to ride around. But in those days, you were on your feet. And a soldier, if he's going to be a good soldier, a warrior, he had to be fast on his feet to chase the enemy, to fight the enemy. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat requires uh, agility. It requires firmness on the, on the ground. And, uh, and you can't be a pushover. And he certainly was not that. His name meant fleetness or fast. Came to be known as one who has valor or a warrior. That's what his name indicated. So he had a great name. And um, uh, it says that he was, where does it say this? And um, come down to, um, let's see. It says that he was a man of great wealth. He was a man of great wealth. Uh, that phrase, wealth, doesn't automatically mean that he was rich. In fact, the word wealth in the Hebrew can mean a number of things. It can mean you have power, you have um, popularity, you are a person of propriety, you are a person of authority, a person of virtue and honor. So when it says he, he uh, was a man of, of wealth... In verse 1 it says that, man of great wealth. It doesn't necessarily mean he was just a rich guy. He wasn't uh, the Elon Musk of his day. Uh, he may have had a lot of money because he did have land, of course. And we know that we'll see later on in chapter 4, 3 and 4, we'll find out that he was a man of influence in Bethlehem. He was a great man of influence. So he was a man of, of wealth a man of influence, he was a man of valor, a man of authority, a man of, of, uh, of, of high profile, all of these things, this is what he was. 
this is what he was. And Ruth, the Bible says, happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Anybody think she just happened to do that? You think she got out there and flipped a coin? Number one, she didn't have a coin to flip, did she? Uh, do you think she drew sticks? Or do you think she did eeny, meeny, miny, bo? This is the one to which I'll go. Uh, she just chose the land. I'm going to go to this field. Something about the field she liked. Maybe there weren't quite as many women following, and she thought, well, I won't have 20 women if I do only five or six. You know, uh, I'll be the last gleaner, uh, but I'll make a good living here. So she chose that, and it says she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz in verse 3. Who was of the family of who? Elimelech. He was a relative of Naomi through marriage because he was a relative of Elimelech. We don't know what kind of relative. What, how, how might he have been related to Elimelech? Just throw out some possibilities. Cause, could have been his cousin. Could have been his brother-in-law. Could have been his brother. Uncle. Nephew. We don't really know. But they were related to each other. And when Naomi found out about that, all of a sudden, we'll see that if not this week, next week. When she saw that, buddy, she saw God's hand in this. Whole possibilities came before Naomi's eyes. And we'll see probably some of that today, certainly by next week. So uh, let's talk about Boaz. Let's remember, again, the historic time frame. When... Did Ruth and Boaz and Naomi live in the history of Israel? At what point were they, were they living? Time of Judges. The time of Judges. Most scholars think it was during the time of Ehud, the left-handed judge, because Israel had just come out of 18 years of slavery, or uh, might as well have been slavery. They were forced to give tribute to Moab. Moab had ruled over them and demanded tribute. That means taxation, kind of like Rome did to Israel for so many years. So they dominated Israel, but then uh, Ehud went out. He said, I got enough of this, and he killed that king, Eglon. Remember the fat king? He, he put that knife in him, and the fat went around the hilt. He couldn't, he couldn't pull it out, neither could Eglon. He couldn't pull it out, uh, and he died. And then uh, Ehud, who was no fool, uh, slipped out, shinned down a rope outside the wind. He got away and locked all the doors. I don't know how long the guy laid there until he was dead. And, you know, like on TV, it says, rigor mortis set in. He's been dead since 1 o'clock. Uh, but they finally got in and found him dead. So Moab, or Ruth, come from Moab, and Boaz come from Israel they were living during the time of the judges. There was no king. Everyone did that which was what in their own eyes? Right. There was no priest around. We don't know where they were. The tabernacle was up in Shiloh. And, to, and during the time of the judges, they weren't worshiping the Lord. They were worshiping everything but the Lord. There was a remnant, a few, that worshiped the Lord. There's always a remnant but by and large, most of the folks were worshiping the Baals and the Asteroids and the other gods. They had special ephods, which are like little idol poles, like little uh, um, totem poles they would put up, and they worshiped these gods there. Uh, and that's where and when they lived. Who was Boaz, though? Where did he come from? Anybody know his ancestral lineage? Rahab was his mother. Rahab was his mother. Salmon was his dad. No kin to fish. And Salmon, Rahab, remember, protected the Israelite spies and, and kept their secret. And when they took Jericho and the walls fell flat, they rescued her and her family. And Salmon took one look at her and said, man, she is cute. I think I want to marry her. Uh, and they did. But her past was a little bit dubious. There's another word, that word again. What was her past? She was an accountant? School teacher? No, she was a prostitute. 
I mean, you know, she had a sign outside the door and everything. I don't know that, but everyone knew she was a woman of the evening. Okay, I don't mean to make light of this. I don't want to get too serious, of course. You won't come back. But um, she was a prostitute, to be sure. But she came to know Jehovah. She came to know the Lord. She put her life and the life of her family on the line. And she said, we are going to be for you because we believe in your God. And we've heard your stories. We've heard about getting out of Egypt. We heard about the Red Sea, the miracles, the pillar of fire in the night, and the pillar of cloud in the day. We've heard all these things. And our hearts have melt because of your God. And I'm no longer going to worship our gods. I'm going to worship your God. And I'm going to put my life on the line and my daddy and my mama and my brothers and my sister my whole family. And when you come to destroy us, please save us. And they tied what color thread on her window? Red, the scarlet thread. There is a hint of the blood of Jesus. When, when I see the blood, when I see the red, I will, what? I will pass over you. He said it to pass over. And when they saw that red, they saved they delivered, they protected the family there of Rahab and her family. And Salmon at some point saw her. They fell in love. They got married. And they had Boaz. Now, there are some Bible scholars who think, you know, they, there's no way that, that Boaz could be the, the son of uh, of, uh, of, 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 of Salmon and Rahab, too many years supposed to go on by, and they do all kinds of uh, genealogical shenanigans. That's my own personal phrase. Um, and I know they want to try to put extra generations in there, but you go and you read uh, the, the ancestry of Jesus in Ma Matthew chapter 1, you come to verse 5, it has the same thing, same thing, that Salmon and Rahab produced Boaz, who produced Oded, who produced David, Jesse, who produced David, you see. I don't know how God did it. I'm thinking, you know what, they lived a long time in those days. Even then they lived a long time. How long? How old was Moses? 120 years. You know, if he hadn't gone all through he went, he might have lived to be 140. You think about all the things that Moses went through with his life. I mean, 40 years in the desert keeping sheep. That's not what I call a health program. That's not what I call some kind of a program that extends your life. That's a, that's a, a, a lifestyle that's a, um, a straining on your life, if anything. But Moses lived to 120, and his eye was not dim, nor was his vigor, whatever, uh, limited or reduced, whatever the word was. You know, uh, he lived long. He could have lived longer. I'm thinking if he hadn't had to be in that desert all those years. If he had stayed in Egypt and lived in the soft life of Pharaoh's son, who knows how long we'd have lived. So folks could live a little bit longer in those days. But the scripture indicates that Salmon and Rahab were the mom and dad of Boaz who married Ruth. And that's what the Bible says. And you know what? I'm not going to try to argue with that. And I'm in good company because our good friend David Jeremiah, whom we all hear, he has the same view. He has, in fact, he said this. Did I quote him somewhere? Let's see. Uh, yeah. Uh, having, now, having said this, let me point out that our good friend and Bible te pastor teacher, David Jeremiah, just takes the text as it is presented as the truth. Well, and that's a refreshing thing. Why are we always trying to find problems with Scripture? Why can't we just take what the Scripture says and just believe it? It makes perfect sense. Sometimes the shenanigans we go through trying to disprove something takes more faith than if you just believe it, what he says. So he says uh, he believes that each generation listed just enjoyed long lives, thus reducing the need to have extra generations recorded or insist that a father named as a grandfather, not the father. So I appreciate uh, Pastor, uh, appreciate Pastor uh, Rogers, uh, 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 Jeremiah agreeing with me. So it's good to know we're in, we're in the same good boat together. So. That's who Boaz was, a man of sterling reputation, a man with uh, a dubious ancestry, because a lot of folks would say who his mother was, and you know the world, they're going to focus on your dark side, isn't that right? Even back then, it's hard to get away from your past. Ruth found that out. Why? How do you know that? Because they kept calling her, what? Ruth the uh, Moabitess. 
and that wasn't a good turn. It's not like saying, oh, you're from Atlanta? Oh, you're from Kansas City? Hmm. No, you're from Moab? That's like saying, oh, I grew up in Las Vegas. Oh, excuse me, I shouldn't say that. But you're on the, the, not on the strip of Las Vegas. So this is where we find her. She is gleaning in the fields. Um, but notice something about, about Boaz here. It's interesting, I found. Verse 4. Now, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers. Now, he's a, he's, this is his field. This is his land. Don't know how many acres he has. It doesn't say. But being a, a man of wealth and propriety and authority and influence and all of these things, it was probably a significant amount of land. And so he, he hired these reapers to go and reap the barley and reap the wheat and whatever. And then you had these gleaners in the back, the poor people, and they would follow along. And he, and he comes in and he said, look what he sees to his reapers in verse 4. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. That struck me. I'm thinking the guy comes up. And rather than say, hey, you missed a spot back there. Uh, hey, hey, get back over there. You're not going fast enough. You should have covered half this field by today. Here it is noontime. And you... No, no. The Lord be with you. I'm thinking, here's this big shot. He's the boss. And he comes in. And he sees his empl- the lowly employees. And he shows them what? Respect. He gives them dignity. He makes them feel like people. And they like it. Look how they respond. The Lord bless you. So I'm looking at this and I'm trying to figure out something about Boaz's character. And right off, I'm thinking, this is a little bit, he's, he's a humble guy. You ever had a boss? Like, you ever had a boss when we used to, when we used to work uh, that just didn't show you respect? First, out of, first thing out of his mouth in the morning is don't forget to do that or you didn't do this yesterday or whatever or you didn't park your car in the right place or, you know, you really shouldn't wear that tie and that, that dress is just not appropriate in the office, you know. That's the first that comes out of his mouth, uh, words of correction, words of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, rebuke rather than the words of affirmation like, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. How's your family? Uh, you doing Okay. That's the kind of guy Boaz was. He wasn't such a big shot, he couldn't take time for the little shots. And he came to those that worked for him, and he treated them as equal. And look how they responded. The Lord bless you. The Lord be with you, and the Lord bless you. It's all about the Lord. And they knew that. And he made them feel important. So I like his humility. I think that's important. It's a good lesson for us to be like that. He was an unusual man with charm and good character. But more than that, or just as important, is his propriety. He sees Ruth out there. And rather than saying, hey, what's she doing here? What, what? You know, I don't want this many women out here. Because we got she's, she's taken... Too much. I mean, there was nothing negative. He says in verse 5, Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge, that's the supervisor, okay? That's the shift supervisor. Whose young woman is this? He's trying to identify her because very few women were unattached, especially young women. Most were married. So he says, she, who's her husband? And if she's married, why is she out here? This is for the poor. These are for people who have no support system. Why is she here? So he, he says, whose young woman is this? He was not indicating anything was improper. He's not sharing anything. Was, he wasn't disapproving. But he had a measure of propriety. He showed proper attitude and proper behavior toward Ruth and about Ruth. So who, who is this young woman? So the servant who was in charge said, it is the young Moab. There it is again. It's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she 
said, that if she came to me and she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning till now, though she rested a little while in the house. So we find here, Boaz is not only a man of great humility, but he's a man of propriety. He makes a normal, expected inquiry into who is this young woman. He must have known the others. He knew the He recognized this girl and that girl. He knew who she, her husband was, and who her daddy was. And he knew who these women were. Here's someone strange he hadn't seen before, but he had heard of her. He had heard of her, and so he, he shows what I think is real propriety and respect uh, about who Naomi is. And then it's what I like to call Boaz's gallantry. He was very gallant, gallant. So after he's talking to his supervisor, he goes over uh, in verse 6, and Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Why did he call her my daughter? Was he really her daddy? No. What did that indicate in that day and age? She was younger. Yes. He was showing her respect and he was establishing the relationship. I'm old enough to be your daddy. You know, it's interesting, at my age, young guys, sometimes, this is a southern thing, uh, I'll call it, hey, son, don't you do it with some guys? You say, son, how you doing? Or you'll see, son, I see see a young guy with a nice mouth, I say, son, you have a nice goatee or something like that. They don't get offended. They know I'm just recognizing they're a younger guy and I could be their dad. But, you know, I never go to a young, and say, my daughter. I just don't do that. I've got two daughters. Actually, I got three. One's with the Lord. But, uh, but he did that to establish propriety, to establish gallantry. He didn't go up there and try to create a relationship that was anything other than proper and respectful, because he had a reputation to guard. Did he not? And he wanted to protect her reputation. We're not making too much of this, I don't think, because of what he says to her. He says, listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field. Don't go over there to that guy's field. Don't go over there to that guy's field. You stay right here uh, on Shiloh Ranch. You stay right here. That's my turn for it. But stay close by my young women. So stay with the young women. Don't get over here by yourself. He's trying to protect her. Is is he not? Stay by the young women. There is safety in numbers. These are my young women. Not mine in personal ownership, but my mind in that they come to my field every day. They've been coming year after year after year. They know I'm generous. They know I have a good field. And they know that my, my, my people will leave, leave enough leavings for them to gather food for that day and the next. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after this. Follow them. Notice this. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? Now, we don't see that part. But I'm thinking maybe when he talked to the supervisor in verse 6 and he said... Uh, or verse 5 and 6, who is this young woman? And he said, it's the young Moabite who came back. I'm thinking at that point, Boaz said, listen, you get to all the young bucks out here and you tell them not to bother this young girl. She's a widow. And she's Naomi's daughter-in-law. And they will treat her with respect and dignity. They will not insult her. They will not put her reputation at risk. They will not any way taint her, 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 her standing in the community, as you might say. We don't know when it was, but at some point, he had talked to the young men, not the old men, to the young men, and said, do not, have I not commanded them not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels you know, we got a water truck over here. We got a water tank. See those oxen in that wagon? 
barrels of water. Go get all the water you want. That's fine. Uh, and, 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 and drank from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face and bowed down to the ground. Now we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll talk about, talk about her response uh, in a few minutes. So he is gallant and he is showing her respect and protecting her. Um, and look at, um, come down to verse 11. Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before the Lord repay your work. You you came to a land and you did not know before. The Lord repay your work with a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for a refuge. He recognizes. He had heard about her. I'm thinking when the guy says, oh, that's Ruth the Moabitess, uh, Naomi's daughter. He said, ah. Oh. He was like the guy with, uh, you know, I could have had a V8. Remember that commercial? Wow, I could have had a V8. He said, oh, I've heard, of, wow, I've heard about her. I knew about her. She left her mother and her father. She left the land of her birth. And she came to a people land she had not known before. She came by faith. She's trusting in the Lord God, Jehovah, Yahweh, the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, the God of Joshua, my God, the God of Bethlehem, the God of Israel. That's the God. She's left Chemosh and she's left the Baals and she's left uh, Asherah. She's left all those gods. And she's trusting in our God. And he prays for her. This is like a prayer. The Lord repay your work with the full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for a refuge. There's that idea of El Shaddai coming under the, under the nurturing, powerful chest of God. The pectoral muscles of a man uh, where his strength lies. So that's how... He responds uh, to her. Then she said, in verse 10, uh, when he says, stay here, don't go anywhere else. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Well, how can she not feel like a foreigner? Everywhere she goes, people make her feel that way. Isn't that right? Ruth the Moabitess, Ruth the Moabitess, Ruth the Moabitess. So she's amazed that he took notice of her. Uh, And then in verse 13, she responds, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord. That's little L, my master, my boss, my authority, my senior. For you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now, I'm not like one of your maidservants. I didn't grow up here in the Shema of Israel. The Lord thy God is one God. I, my father never walked around in, in the house teaching me the law of God. I didn't know about any of these things till I came here, till I met Naomi, till I, until I met my husband who died when he was young. But you've spoken kind to me. I'm, but I'm not like one of your maidservants. I'm from Moab. I'm a Moabitess. I'm a former worshiper of Baal. I'm a former practitioner of Baalism and all the others, but you have shown me comfort and you've spoken kindly to me. Now look at verse 14. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, meal time, so he took her out for lunch. And don't read anything into that. That's just more of his fatherly uh, offers towards her. He sees her as a victim. He sees her as a target. He sees her as one who he wants to spread his protection over her. He's not thinking anything else at this point. And when he does think those thoughts, guess who initiated that? Ruth, under the ideas of Naomi. Naomi cooked the whole thing up. We'll see that next week in in, uh, the next chapter called Romance, the Romantic. Uh, the matchmaker, that little old matchmaker, Naomi. So she's, verse, uh, verse 14, Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. That's like Olive Garden. You know, get a little saucer, you know, with the oil and you dip your bread in that. Man, it's so good. Um, 
So she sat beside the reapers. They weren't by themselves. She's with the who? The reapers. The other employees are all sitting around at lunchtime having happy meals. And he passed parched grain to her, and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. She kept some back. Why? Yeah, a to-go box to take it home to Naomi. And when she rose up, verse 15, to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean, even among the sheaves. Get that. She no longer has to follow behind. She didn't have to pick up the, she can, pick, she can go and get the sheaves themselves. She can go to the head, of the head of the group there, he's saying to her. Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And, and also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. And leave that she may glean and do not rebuke her. I'm going to tell you, this Boaz, quite a guy. He goes up and he sees something special about Ruth. He sees a vulnerability. He sees this young girl who is a foreigner in a strange land. Now, you know, we know so much about Israel because of our time in church, time of Sunday school and Bible studies and, and from the pulpit. We, we feel like we know Ruth, the, the history of, of Israel pretty well. But think about this girl. She knew nothing about it. And she's totally a stranger. So he wants to protect her and guide her, and he commands these uh, to not only let her glean above the sheaves, but when you're walking along, go ahead and you know, drop a burrito here and there. Just go ahead and drop a little bit. Make sure she picks it up, you know. I mean, the fix was in from the minute from, 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 uh, uh, from Boaz about Ruth looking after Ruth. Verse 17, so she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. Then she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And that's an amazing thing. In verse 19, and her mother-in-law said to her, where have you gleaned today? Where did you go? And where did you work? And blessed be the one who took notice of you. So far, Naomi's in the dark. She hasn't got a clue where Ruth went. Now, before we move on to the rest of this chapter in the next uh, nine minutes, maybe ten, um, something about Boaz that I want to share. And, uh, and this goes to all of us, mostly the men. And I know we've raised our children, we've raised our sons, but how many of you got grandsons? How many got great grandsons? Come on, be honest. Okay, listen, your job's not done. Uh, and what I'm going to share with you is not original with me. Nothing is ever original with me. Trust me, I've got it from someone else. That's just how it goes. But um, I was at a conference several years. Some of y'all were. Who was with us at Gatlinburg when Ollie North was there? Colonel Oliver North, remember? And he spoke. And then he had a table. You can go meet him, and he signed books for you and all. And I'll, Ronnie. Smile and shake your head if you remember he what he talked about. He talked about Christian manhood, in particular, young men, and how the older men need to teach the younger men. And he says, this is what I teach my boys, or taught my boys, because his boys have grown even then. And he said this, he said, every man will fall into one of three categories. And I'll never forget, and I was... That's just like two years ago. So I was an older guy myself then. Three categories. Number one, he might be a what I what he called a prey. P-R-E. What's a P-R-E-Y? What's a prey? Yeah. Yeah, he takes, he gets taken advantage. If you're a prey, you're the bug in the mouth of the spider. You know, you're the prey. You're the bait. He's talking about men that that when they grew up, they weren't treated right. They had disabilities. They had deficiencies. They had lackings. Maybe their parents were abusive or neglectful or whatever. And they grew up, and they just felt like the doormat of the world. Ever know somebody like that? 
they just felt like they are the doormats. Everybody picks on them. Nobody likes them. They're just kicked around. They can't hold a job. They can't find a girl. They can't find a buddy. They, you know, they, they flunked out of college, and they just feel like they're, they, they've just been abused by people. And a lot of men fall into that category, and that's such a sad thing. You don't want that for your children, your sons, even your daughters. Number two, a man could be a predator. What's a predator? A predator is someone who takes advantage of people. These are men who use their strength, their financial power, their position, their physical strength, whatever they've got going. They use it to use and abuse the weak like their girlfriends, like their wives. These are the kind of men that get involved in domestic violence situations. I dealt a lot when I was working with Child Protective Services, uh, dealt a lot with what they call domestic violence. Let me tell you something about these guys. Every one of them is a coward. Every one is a coward. But they use their strength and their wealth and whatever to abuse wives, girlfriends, children, and anyone that's weak. They're a predator. And that brings us to the third category, that every man might be, every boy should be, and that is a protector. He uses his wealth, his strength, his education, his abilities, whatever God's given him, he uses it to protect people, to advance people, to help people. He does that with his girlfriends and with when he's married and his children, his co-workers, his best friends. He wants to protect them. He wants to advance them. He wants to keep them. That's Boaz. He wasn't a prey. He wasn't anybody's fool. Nobody kicked him around. Nobody wiped their feet on him. He wasn't a predator. He, if, if he was a predator, man, he could have had his time with Ruth. He was, he was a protector. He wanted to protect her heart, her body, and her future, and he did all of that. And so I just throw that out today, not as really a part of the story, but to encourage us as men that if we've got sons and grandsons, we need to sit them down and say, son, you can be. You got to decide now. If you're nine or ten years old, you need to decide now. You want to be a prey. You want to be a predator. You want to be a protector. And let them see those qualities in you. That quality in you. That, that won't cost you anything. Uh, you can give me a dollar on your way out if you want to. But we'll stop there. All right. He, so, um, in in his prayer, we find in verse. Uh, 11, 12, uh, there in chapter 2, in uh, what he says, I, I kind of noted several things about God that I think his prayer indicates he believes. This is what I'm calling Boaz theology. This is what he believed. First of all, he believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He believed in the God of Moses. That's who he believed in. And he believed God was a refuge for those who needed refuge. He believed God was compassionate. He believed God was gracious. He believed God was kind. He believed God was protective. And he believed God is a rewarder of those who do good, those who believe on him. All those things we see reflected in his prayer. He had a pretty good theology. Pretty good theology. It's the kind of theology that leads to heaven. He believed God like Abraham did, and God credited that to him as righteousness. Just like when we believe on Jesus, God uh, contributes that to our righteousness to us. So that's, uh, that's Boaz. Now, uh, 14, we've already read this passage, 14 through 17, uh, is Boaz's provision, how he provided food and extra food for her safety and security. He did all of that. He gave, he gave Ruth permission. He gave her provision. He gave her privilege. He gave her protection. He gave her all those things. Um, And then look at um, 13, 7, and 18, 21, and 23. Let's move on real quickly. Verse 20, Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, this is after she told him, Oh, Boaz, he's the guy who's in the field I gleaned in today. Naomi said, Blessed be the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. Boy, she's kind of changed her tune, hasn't she? She's gone from God has afflicted me. God was bitter with me. God testified against me. Now she's saying, bless the Lord. Wow. He's shown kindness to the living and the dead. Who are the dead for her? Elimelech, her sons. 
how is God showing kindness to them? Because they died without an heir, right? But now she's seeing, hmm, little old matchmaker Naomi, if I can work things out where Ruth and Boaz get together, and Ruth can be, Boaz can be the kinsman redeemer, and then I'll have a grandson, and the dead will be remembered. She's seeing all this in her mind, just like that. Oh, her mind works quick. And so she says uh, to Naomi, this man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth the Moabitess, still there, are we? <coughs> he also said to me, uh, well, Ruth said to her, he also said to me, you shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, you do not go out after the, that you, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, and that people do not meet you in any other field. Don't you, you stay in Boaz's field? So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. We're going to stop there because the real exciting stuff starts next week. This is where we see Naomi and all of her brilliant machinations as she sets up one of the greatest romances and marriages in history she engineers the whole thing underneath the sovereign leadership of almighty God who from the start had this whole thing planned out God has had this whole thing planned we saw it in the book of Esther did we not remember Esther pondering the pondering the puzzle of providence how and 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 uh Mordecai said, who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is your time to shine, baby. This is your time. Well, they went down to Moab, and Elimelech died, and Kelion died, and Malon died, and there Naomi and Ruth and Orpah were widows, and Orpah leaves, and they go back to Israel, and man, it just looks horrible. God's got the whole thing planned out. God is looking down, he's looking down so far. He's looking down past Ruth and Boaz getting together, past their son, past their grandson, all the way to King David and beyond. Because Bethlehem was the house of bread, right? And who was born in Bethlehem? And he said, I am the what? Bread of life that has come down. See how God engineers all of that. That's how God puts this book together. It's amazing, uh, amazing. So, Father, we just thank you for your precious word. I, I literally could stand here all afternoon, uh, and we could go rest the book and then go into the next one. Just thank you for your precious word, Father. It's inspiration. It's authority. It's, it's uh, inerrancy. Uh, it's validity. Uh, it's veracity. It just entices me every day to get up and to immerse myself in the pages of your word. And I pray that everyone here, and I believe it's true, every, they wouldn't be here, Lord, on a rainy day if they too didn't have a love and a hunger and a thirst for the word of God. Nourish our souls. Make us like Jesus as we read this precious book, we pray. Father, once again, I want to pray for the service coming up this Sunday. I pray for Pastor Rick. Lord, that you keep him physically strong, that you will uh, uh, seal the message you've given him in his heart. We pray for Pastor William as he is setting up the music. Pray for the choir, the praise band, for the soloist. We pray, Lord, for uh, the, the ceremony of transition uh, that Pastor Rick uh, has planned underneath your leadership. We pray for uh, Brother Josh and McCaffrey and the kids as they drive up Saturday. Give them safety as they come. Just may this be a glorious weekend, Father, of praise and adoration of you. We're not here to praise Pastor Rick, praise Pastor uh, uh, Josh. We're not here to praise our search team, although we're so thankful for them. We're here to praise you because you are the one, just like with Ruth, you're the one that's engineering all of this. And you are the head of this church. You are the shepherd, the chief shepherd of Cornerstone Baptist Church. And we thank you for the under-shepherds you've placed here. And we pray that you will bless Pastor Josh as he begins his ministry here. We pray for those under him, Pastor Dennis, um, uh, myself, uh, Pastor William. 
We thank you for the office staff. We thank you for uh, our minister of children. We thank you for Jim Major and maintenance, Laura. We thank you for our uh, financial secretary. We thank you for Joanne and Linda and, and, uh, and uh, Cindy uh, and Kathy. We pray for Gabriella with our We School. Laura, we just pray as Pastor Josh be over all of these people. Help us one and all to love him, to pray for him, to encourage him. Father, may your lordship, your rule emanate through these people you have set here at Cornerstone. So we love you. We thank you for this day. Give us safety on the wet roads, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.